if you are aspiring a career in IT, whether it is cloud, it is legacy traditional networking, or you are in software engineering, in development, in DevOps, in DevSecOps, GetOps, in whatever system administration, you need to learn Linux and you need to learn it now. So my name is Isa Abu Sharif and I have with me Mustafa El Shami. So let's get to know him because he would be doing most of the course. I am Mustafa and I'll be your instructor for this Linux Fundamentals video course. I worked for Dell Technologies as a senior technical support engineer for more than five years and I had a huge experience in managing and troubleshooting Linux based systems. I also hold two Red Hat certifications, RHCSA and RHCE, and I have five AWS certifications, including the Solutions Architect Professional Certificate. I have been delivering on-site training for three years already, and I have many people acquiring the RHCSA certification. I put everything I know in Linux in this course, including things I wish I knew earlier that would have helped me a lot in my job. If you never knew anything about Linux, this course is the best for you. Worth mentioning that Linux is like learning the alphabets of language. And by learning Linux, you land your foot in the world of IT and you'll be ready for many jobs. In this course, we're going to use virtualization environment will be the EC2 service on AWS. AWS EC2 is a compute service from Amazon Web Services that will allow you to get a ready to use Linux virtual machine. This has the advantage that you are going to get some experience with AWS. So how can we do that? First, we'll create an account on AWS. Then from EC2 service, you select an instance from the free tier and use the Linux operating system. Then you'll connect to your machine from the comfort of your laptop or online. Okay, so let's create our first AWS account. So in the sign up page for AWS, the first step is to choose an email. So I type in my email and then it asks me about uh, a, a strong password. So I provided a strong password, but actually it looks like it doesn't contain non-alphanumeric characters. So I added one and then I repeated that step again. And then uh, I choose my AWS account name. So that takes me to next step, which is uh, choosing uh, the AWS account plan, whether it's going to be business or personal. Um, this course will be within the free tier. So we'll choose personal and then we'll fill out um, the, the whole form. So that actually would take, uh, take us to step three, which is the billing information. They'll ask you about uh, uh, credit or debit card details. Uh, and so I provided my uh, credit card details. And don't worry, it won't charge you anything, just one USD or one euro for verification. So it's, it's totally safe. Um, so after verifying your credit card, that would take you to step four, which is the um, identity. So in my case, I'm based at Cairo. So I choose the country name or the country code to be Egypt and then continue filling, out, filling it out. So last step will ask you about um, the support plan, which support plan we're going to use. This course will be again uh, in the free tier. So we'll choose the basic, the basic support. However, there are other support plans for developer and business support, which is for uh, big enterprises or individual developers and so on. So basically in, in, in this course, all you need is uh, the basic support. Maybe later you can upgrade, but we'll use the basic support for now. And then last step is uh, completing sign up. And for now, AWS, we just created our, our, our AWS account. So basically you can go to the AWS management console and start logging in. After we've created our first account on AWS. So this is basically the dashboard or the AWS management console that you're going to see. If you are new to AWS, you're not going to see anything from the recently visited. It's going to be empty. So now we want to create an instance on the cloud or a virtual machine on the cloud or like a computer. 
that we can use anytime on the cloud. So this is very easy, very simple. We have to search for the EC2 service. It's one of the most popular services on AWS. If you have visited before, you can click on it. If you'd like to search for it, all you need to type is EC2 and you will going to find it to find it. Also, you can go there from services, compute, EC2 and click on it. Then we're going to click on launch instance. I'm going to provide a name for it. So for example, Linux instance for practice. And I'm going to choose the distro or in AWS language, the Amazon machine image or the image. I'm going to use Amazon Linux too. And of course, feel free to use um, some other Linux distros. For example, we have Red Hat already and it's free tier eligible. That means that you're not going to pay anything for using it. And uh, we have SUS Linux, Debian and so on. But I'm going to stick for Amazon Linux too. Um, and then I'm going to leave everything as it is in type is T2 micro if you're in, on the Frankfurt region. And for the key pair, if you are new to EC2, just click on create a new key pair and I'm going to name it Dolphin. And then I'm going to click on create key pair. And that's it. I'm going to leave create security group and allow SSA traffic from anywhere. One last thing is to go down to advanced details and expand it and go all the way down to the user data box. In this box, there is an attachment and at the beginning of the course, and I may leave it as well in this video. And this attachment called user data, it's a text file, and this is the content of it. I'm going to update this every now and then. And regardless of what you see at the moment, all you need to do is just select all, copy and paste it under the user data. And that's it. And things will make sense and you'll understand it later in this course and in upcoming course of AWS. So now we are done with preparing our first EC2 instance or our first VM. And all we need to do is click on launch instance. And I will go to view all instances. And this is the instance that I have just created. L Linux instance for practice. I'm going to refresh. And here we go. Now it's running. So how to connect to it, how to get a terminal to start practicing Linux commands. So I'm going to click on this one, select it and connect and I'm going to click on connect. So now we have the terminal, so I can zoom in if I want better visibility. And now I can switch to root by sudo su. And now I can start practicing the Linux commands, for example, and learn Linux the easiest way possible. If you are not able to connect to this instance, you get an error like fail to connect to EC2, just go to uh, the instance one more, more and more time and then go to security and click on security groups and go to the inbound rules and go to edit inbound rules and just make sure that you have SSH from the drop down menu and the source is custom and um, the 0, .0, 0, 0 from everywhere and save rules and it's going to work fine with you. So now we are ready to practice Linux on EC2 instance on AWS. What's Linux? I'd like to answer this question by asking another question, which is, what isn't Linux? Linux is embedded in everything in our lives. You interact with Linux operating systems every day when you open an e-commerce website or social media application through the World Wide Web. And that's because most of the websites are hosted on very specialized computers that we call servers. And these servers work on Linux based operating systems. Think of it as our user friendly laptops in which we use user friendly Microsoft Windows operating systems to do our simple jobs. 
Linux is an operating system for computers that are usually used to support web hosting or storage solutions or even big data applications. Worth mentioning that Linux manages systems for the world stock markets, powered smart devices, and most of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Linux also powers the cloud revolution and supports the tools for building containers, which is a booming technology. All that I have mentioned at this point tell us that Linux is a critical technology for IT enthusiasts to learn and understand. And from my point of view, I believe that Linux is the alphabet of IT. You learn Linux and then you can learn anything else in IT. Finally, if you are looking for a fresh start in IT, Linux is a high demand skill nowadays and lots of companies seek to hire Linux administrators. Why Linux is a great technology? First, Linux is open source software. And by open source, we mean that anyone can use study, modify, and share the source code of the software. The output of this is more collaboration, sharing, transparency, and rapid innovation among the developers to improve the software. Think of it as it's a game that you, as a developer, can have its source code and just update it to include new levels and just share it with your friends. It's as simple as that, and this is one important reason why Linux is a great technology. The second important thing is that Linux is a modular operating system that allows developers to add, replace, or remove components. With that, a company or a developer may add something to make Linux general purpose workstation or make it an extremely specialized software appliance that achieves a certain objective. For example, some storage vendors just use Linux to add some modules and some functionalities so that it's directed to deliver storage services. The third and last reason is a powerful command line interface. And we'll see that throughout the entire course. Linux was built in a way that users can perform all system administration tasks through the CLI. By using CLI, it's super fast, super effective, and super easy to automate, deploy, and provision your application and make system administration so simple compared to the graphical user interface option. We'll see throughout the course that we can implement tasks by typing a few characters with the keyboard. There are more reasons to answer this question, but we just have mentioned the most relevant ones. So when did this start? In 1991, a smart computer science student at the University of Helsinki called Linus Torvalds started a project that turned out to be the Linux kernel. And the kernel is the core component of the operating system, which manages hardware, memory, and scheduling of running programs. Linus Torvalds has written a program by himself for the purpose of using his own hardware and use the function of his hardware processor independently of an operating system. But Linux kernel on its own is of no use. So Linux had to join the GNU project, and by then the kernel was supplemented with open source software like MIT's X Windows system, SendMail mail server, Apache HTTP web server, and other components. All these were added together to complete an open source Unix-like operating system. As time passes, it started to be challenging to assemble pieces from many sources with the Linux kernel. Therefore, Linux developers started to gather pre-built and tested tools and components inside an operating system and call it a distribution, short for a distro, so that users can download distribution to set up a Linux system quickly. And now, many different Linux distributions exist. Each distribution had a distinct purpose and goal. For example, some developers may gather components on the Linux kernel to provide a distro for general purposes like CentOS, or maybe a distro can be used for a single purpose like privacy and security like Parrot OS. The provider of the distribution must support that software, and typically there is a community for the developers who developed that distro. 
examples of many Linux distros like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, Ubuntu, and there are many, many other distros. The terminal is the program that allows us to run commands. In Windows, it's called PowerShell, or maybe we can do it with command prompt. In Linux, the frequent term we use is just the terminal. And terminals actually are different. They can go from a very basic one that doesn't have or doesn't support any colors or any fonts, all the way to very powerful terminals that we can do many things with it. For example, a very basic one is putty. A very advanced one is the mobile term. And now we have our terminal here on AWS. It's called the easy to instance connect. So it's a web terminal. It's very easy, very straightforward. And we can do actually cool stuff with it. So let's get started. So what can I do with this terminal? First thing, if this is too far from you, maybe we can zoom in. So all I need to do is go to the three dots at the right hand side and just click on the plus sign. And now it provides better visibility. What else can I do? I can change the coloring of this terminal. So how can I do that? This is by using the set term command. And this is the very first command that we're going to use in set term coming from set terminal. And for example, if I want to use a green color, I will use dash four as in foreground and I will just pick green and now I can see font color has changed to green. So what if I wanted bold? So I can just add dash bold. And if I want this, so I will just add on and I'll click enter. And now the color is bold, the font is bold and the color is green, which gives better visibility. So what if, for example, I want to write in a red font with a white background. So it's very simple. We follow the same approach. So term four is going to be red. And for example, I want that on a white background. So back is going to be white and I will click enter. And it's pretty much the same idea. So I can clear and now the entire terminal has changed to background and um, red font. However, for better visibility for the entire course, I'd like to just to stick to the green foreground with bold on and the background is going to be default, which is black. I know it's black, but I just use the default, which is, for example, this background color, which close to black. So I will clear and now I'm ready to just start running my commands and learn the difference between the shell and bash. So what is the shell? The shell is a group of predefined commands. The default shell is called the bash shell. There are other shells like the corn shell, which I can install on my system by running the command. So I'll type su and then the password. Okay, and yum install ysh. Okay, so now we have both the bash shell and the corn shell. So let's see the difference between both shells. For example, now I am at the bash shell. I can run the command echo. Hello world. And run the command print. Hello world. You will see there is an error with the print command as it's not found in the bash shell, okay? However, if I switch to the corn shell by running case h and then run both commands again, so echo, hello world, again, and print, hello world. So you'll see the print command is recognized here and it can be found and can be run without any issues in the corn shell. That was a basic example to get an idea of the shells.
And shells are something that can be developed. Meaning at a high level, I can develop my commands and put them in a shell and name it like dolphin shell. So you get the idea. Finally, I believe you are a little bit familiar with bash. Think of it as a command line interpreter that's similar in concept to the PowerShell in Windows. Bash has a powerful sophisticated script language and can support the automation of tasks. So let's run some commands in the Linux terminal. The structure of the syntax of the command consists of command with options and possibly several arguments. For example, we can run the command date. And you can see it displays the current date time value. We can run it this way or we can run it with some options. So how we can get an idea of the available options, we can type date dash dash help. So after running this, we can see we can run the command using all these options with these format. For example, we can run the command with plus and percentage or capital. So it displays the hour and minutes. So let's try this. So date plus percentage R. And we can run date plus percentage X. And you can see it displays only the date. So the date command is an example of a command that doesn't have any arguments. We'll move to the command echo, which takes one argument. So basically you type echo and it prints what comes next to it. So echo, hello world. And it prints hello world. One more example is the file command. So this command as well, it takes one argument and it's used to identify the type of the argument. So when I type file slash etc slash password, it tells me it's an ASCII text. However, when I type file slash etc, it tells me it's a directory. Speaking of files, let us go quickly on some super important commands. If I want to view an entire file, we can use the command cat. So for example, cat slash etc slash password. So it prints out everything inside the file. If I want to view the first lines of the same file, we can use head slash etc slash password. And these are the only first lines. If I want to view the last 10 lines of the same file, we can use tail slash etc slash password. Now the question is, what if I need to view only the last five lines in a set of 10 lines? I will wait for, for five seconds so that you can challenge yourself. Yes, exactly. If you don't know, if you only know that tail is used to print out the last lines, you can type tail dash dash help. And after we're going through the options, okay, so basically this is the way it's run. So you provide options and then you provide the file. So after going through the options, you can see that dash n is the option we want. It output the last number of lines instead of the last 10. So this is the option. So again, I clear it and then tail dash n number of lines, I'll type five slash etc slash password. And here we go. So 
The last command we are going to run in this hands-on will be the command that takes two arguments, like the copy command, which we'll discuss later in detail in module 4. To copy a file, we'll need to run the cp command and specify the location or the path of the file at the first argument and the destination path as the second argument. So here we go. cp etc password and another in the same di directory, password2. Okay, so now we are in Dolphin, so I'll switch user to, I will type search user, so as you. So cp etc password etc password2 and it returns without any error. If you want to know where are we or in which directory you are working in, we can run the command pwd. And we can see we are under home slash dolphin. If we'd like to go to any directory, we can use the command cd stands for change directory. So if we type cd slash, then that will take us to the root directory, where all other directories start from. And you can see the current working directory changes to slash. Okay. And if we run pwd one more time, we will see we have moved to the root directory. Now, how to list what are the branches or the subdirectories from the root directory? We run ls command. All directories under the slash root, under the root directory, contain a certain type of subdirectories or files. And that represents the file system hierarchy. We will discuss in concept the content and usage of each directory in the, in the last lecture of this section. From the root directory, we can go to any directory like home by running cd slash home, which is the absolute path, or cd home, which is the relative path, and both will do the job because we are at the root directory. So we go to the home directory and then we can do listing again. But this time I want to use ls-l option, which will provide some information regarding the listing, like the permissions, like the user and group ownership and the last modification date. So, and we'll discuss this later in this call. Don't worry. So, at this point, I will go to the Dolphin directory by using the relative path. So, cd dolphin, and I am there. If I wanted to, to use the absolute path, I'd run cd home slash dolphin. So, you get the idea. Okay. Some useful shortcuts will be cd double dots, which will bring me to the parent directory, or one dot, which means go to the current directory. And this doesn't make sense because with the cd command doesn't make sense. However, it will make sense with the cp command. Also, I can run cd tilde. Okay, and it will get me to the current home directory again, the control home directory of the current user, which is the root. Okay, so the final thing I'd like to highlight here is the magic of using the tab tab. Do you remember the auto completion in Linux? For example, if you go to the root directory, And you want to change the directory, but you don't want to use the command ls. You can use tap tap, and it will show you all the available options to go to. And if you type the letter v, and you type one tap, it will complete 
it to var since no other directories start with var, with v. So if you want to go to sys directory from root and you type s, so cd slash s on tap, it won't complete, right? So you know there are other options to use. So when you press double taps, it will show you all options that start with s. So we have sbin, we have serve, and we have sys. So again, tap tap is very, very useful tool, very useful. And personally, it helped me a lot for many, many years working with Linux operating system. And it would help you a lot if you get the error for no such file or directory. In this video, we are going to play around with files and directories, how to create them, remove them, copy them, and move or rename them. So let's move to the home directory and we'll go to the Dolphin directory to practice this. So cd home slash dolphin. Okay, so here we go. First thing, let's create some empty files and by that we'll use the command touch. So I run touch file one and it works. It doesn't show me any error, so it works. And we can verify that the file has been created by running the ls command. So here we go. I can create multiple files like touch file two file three file four and that would create the other files okay so we have the, the new files also i can use special expression so i can run touch file curly bracket five to nine Five double dots nine, so it's five to nine. And you can see it has created files five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's the first special expression we take in this course. So that's the case with the files. If you want to create directories, we will use the command make dire. So I will run make dire dolphin dire that's the name of that directory i want to create and by running ls we can see the directory is in blue the dolphin dire it's in blue so that may, means it's a directory also if we want to create a nested directory like dolphin dire 2 like make dire dolphin dire 2 slash sub d slash sub sub d we need to specify dash p option as in parent and it will create all the subdirectories in one command pretty easy right okay so moving forward let's copy some file to other directories for example i need that file one to be under the dolphin directory. So how I can do that? I can use the command cp. So cp file one and the destination which will be dolphin dire flash. So if I run ls dolphin dire, we can see the file is already there. Pyron. So if I want to copy the directory dolphin dire under the, for example, temp directory, then I will use the same command cp dolphin dire and slash temp. Okay, but it will give me an error that we need to specify the recursive option. So I run it again. So up arrow and, and just dash r and it works it doesn't show me any error so let's clear this okay 
So we can verify that by listing what's inside the temp and we can see the dolphin diary is there. Okay, very easy. Let's move to the move command. And in fact, we can use it in two ways. First, the common use case is moving the files or directories from a location to another. Like I can move file to here, I can move it to be under the dolphin dire or dolphin dire. Okay, so how can I do this? I can say move file to dolphin dire. Okay, and when I list what's inside the current directory, we don't we no longer see the file to. It's not there. And when we list what's inside the dolphin dire, we can see the file to has been moved. Okay, and the same goes with directory. So you can try that by yourself. Second use case is renaming the file, which means that if I run move file three to the name of the new file, so test, and we'll list. So we can see file three again no longer exists. However, that file test is has replaced it. And if I run move file four home dolphin, which is our current working directory, test two we can see it has been renamed again to test two while test three file three uh, no longer exists if you want to remove a file we will use the command rm and type the file so rm file tap tap and we see we have a bunch of files okay so i will choose five five so rm five five and then it will ask me if i want to remove it so I press yes, and then it's removed. Okay, in case of directories, we will use the recursive option. So I will run rm-r dolphin dire slash, and it will ask me if I want to delete each file inside of it and the whole directory. So I press yes, and then yes, and the last one, and the last one. Okay, so it's removed. Dolphin Dire no longer exists. The last thing, if I want to remove the entire directory and I don't want to be asked for each file or directory, I will use the dash F option with the dash R. So I will run rm dash RF Dolphin Dire 2. Okay. And it's deleted without any ask. Okay, so be careful when you use the rm-rf command. Tab completion is one of the most powerful tools in Linux and it saves a lot of time. Tab completion allows a user to quickly complete commands or file names after they have typed enough at the prompt to make it unique. For example, you are pretty sure that there is a command for changing the password for each user, and this command starts with pass, P-A-S. To ask the prompt for help to get you all choices for command that start with pass, you press double tap. So pass and double tap. And now you can see we only have three options, password, paste, and pass as pender. You see, it's super cool, like an MCQ exam. For now, I know pretty sure that the command password, this is the command I want. I don't need to write all password this way. We can just add an S and press a single tap and it will auto complete it for me because no other commands are starting with pass except for the password command. It also works with options completion, for example, if I type user add, 
which is a command to create a new user, and we press dash, and then tap tap. You can see all options available to use. Moving along with our course and our journey in Linux, the single tab or double tab should be our way to complete the commands or the destination path. To get back to the recently run command, you can use the up arrow and down arrow to navigate through the history of the commands. That would save me some time writing the command all over again if the commands are recent. I can get them by pressing a few up arrows, so it's super easy and super fast. So what if I need to see all the commands I run for this user? For this, I can run the history command. And you can see the output of the commands I run with their indexes. Not that you may get different output because I run different commands than you while preparing for this course, so don't worry. Also, we'll learn how to search for a specific keyword in history later in this course. If you want to run a certain command in the history, it's very easy. You just press the bang button and then the number of the command. For example, I'll choose. I'll choose this one, 55. So bang, 55. And you can see it implemented, it run the command number 55 in history output. Think of the manual pages as a huge book or reference, which consists of a few sections, and each section has a different content. Each section contains a group of commands with their complete documentation. Whenever you want to refer to the documentation of a random command, like touch, you simply run man touch. So I'll run man touch. And you can see the entire documentation of the touch command. By convention, we say that the touch command is used to create a new file. However, when we read the documentation, we see it's used to update the access time and modification time of the input file of each file to the current time. And if the argument doesn't exist, it's created empty. You can navigate through the manual of the touch command the same way you use with the commandless. You can use the arrows up and down to scroll up and down. If you want to jump to the end of the manual, you press Shift G. And if you want to go to the top of the page, you press G. If you want to search for a keyword downward, for example, time, then you press slash and type time. It will highlight all keywords like time and you move between the keywords by pressing N letter till you go to the bottom. If you want to go back or search upwards, you can just press the question mark sign and then type time one more time and use the N again to get to the next word. So I believe it's pretty easy and navigating through the manual is something extremely important if you want to get familiar with how to use the commands and how to search for a specific keyword in a command. You will need to edit text files to configure your system. First of all, let's man them and you can see it's vi improved and a programs text editor and you can see that we can use it by running vim and the file with options so vim is a configurable text editor and to view one simple difference between vi and vim we can use both to open the file slash etc slash password for example vi etc 
password and you can see it's a configuration file and all the lines are as one block without any coloring and formatting but when you vim etc password you can see that each column has a certain color and it has a better view and visibility this feature for example helps the administrator or the developer to write configuration files correctly with minimal human error this is applied to a pre-configured file so let's edit this file however since this is a very important configuration file the etc password I will copy it first and place it under temp. So cp etc password temp. Okay, so here we go. So let's vim this file. So vim temp password. And the first thing that you can see it has no coloring. So since this is a new file, you need to configure it to get it colored. This is out of the scope of this course. For now, we are in slash temp slash password. And the first thing, we are currently in the command mode. We can move up and down, right or left, but we can't add anything. I'm pressing Y or pressing T. You can't add anything at the moment. However, we can run a command to remove one line like the command DD. So DD and the line is removed. There are many commands to run in the mode, but I'll leave it to you to explore through the man or any other external search engine. We agree that whenever you vim a file, it automatically gets you to the command mode. If you want to edit this file, you must go to the edit mode by using the letter I. Now we have insert mode. Okay. So, and I can finally edit this file. I can type hi. This is dolphin base. So I can finally edit it. And to go back to the command mode, we can press escape and it will take us back to the command mode. Another mode that we can go to, which is the visual mode. We can go to this mode by typing V small and you can select multiple characters for text manipulation you can press shift v so it's line entire line you can select entire line or control v you can use it for column selection and after we select the text we you can use for example remove it by clicking on the letter x so it, it's it is removed we can also select the block for copy paste as you, we do in windows so for example shift v I will copy two lines and I'll press Y for yanked and then I'll move to the end of the file by Shift G and we'll paste it by pressing P and you can see I have pasted the three lines or the two lines I selected at the beginning. So it's pretty easy and after editing two or three files I'll be sure you'll master the skill. The final mode is the extended command mode, or the exit mode, as I like to call it, in which we tell the utility what are we going to do with these modifications. So we go there by typing semicolon, and then the word W for saving. Now it's saved. And if I want to quit, I'll type Q, semicolon, Q, and then I'm out. I can go there again, then temp password and apply some modifications so hey there once again okay and i can go to a exit mode by using escape to the command mode and then to the extended mode semicolon wq for saving and we can also use the bang for overriding the modifications so here we go so that's all for vim and that's all you need to get this moving with the tools we have discussed in this video, you can master the Vim, master editing files. And of course, if you can read the man or play around with it to discover, you can discover amazing things and you can be fast and effective with them. To know any information about any user, we use the command ID. If I type ID without any argument, 
it takes the current user working on the terminal and you can see we are working as dolphin and i will switch user to root and id one more time and you see we are running as root let's create some users so to create users we use the command user id so i'll create six users so user add ahmed and we see by running id okay id ahmed so ahmed takes at the id 1001 and we'll get to that in a little bit also one more thing whenever a user is created a group with the same name of the user is created automatically so there is a group called ahmed that is created automatically when we created ahmed so i will create more users so user add david user add maria and i will run for example i will specify some options just for fun i can use man or dash help for that so i'll run user add dash u four 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 muhammad and we can verify muhammad has taken double fours quad fours so here we go worth mentioning that root user usually takes or always takes the id zero while the system users take from 1 to 999 and other users take from 1000 and above so we continue adding users with some options so user add dash c adding a comment this is for test fernando okay user add dash s has been no login Sarah, and here i specified that this user shouldn't log into any shell or in other words it will log in however it doesn't she doesn't have any shell to run any command form you read more more about the options dash s dash c dash u from the manual finally i'll add user add emily and here we go okay so if we want to delete any of the newly created users we will use user del so user del maria and we verify by id maria and prompted me maria no such user okay so same thing now i'd like to move to groups okay so it follows the same analogy so group adds hr and we'll get to verification in a little bit as the id command is only limited to users so again i can add one more group with an option like u or option like g so group add the g 4000 as group id developers and finally two groups without options so group add finance and group add operations and here i want to stop at something extremely important it's time to finally work on the first configuration file and when we say configuration file we think we need to check something in the etc directory right so here we are going to check the etc the slash etc password file which we have mentioned a few times earlier in this course so for user we can check user information by checking the id however if we want to check the source of it or like where the user information come from we can view etc password so i will use vim
So we can see the users we created. Each one of them takes a line. And this line consists of seven fields. The first one is name. The second is the password, but it's encrypted. Third is user ID. Fourth is primary group ID. Fifth is the comment for this user. We can see the comment we left for Fernando. Okay. And sixth is the home directory. So, so home slash Fernando. So by default, the system creates a directory with the username under the home directory for each user. And whenever a user logins, it gets him to the directory. Finally, the seventh field is the shell type. So with the default option, every user will use the bash shell. And you can see here, I specified a different shell with user Sora, which is a shell that doesn't allow any user to run any command like the system uses here. So I will close the Vim for now and just tail the last lines. So tail etc password. And let me first choose a password for David. Okay, so I'll run the command password David. And the password will be dolphin again. And here we go. So if we switch to David from root, there isn't any authentication requested because I'm coming from root. Okay. However, if I come from any external user like Dolphin, it asks for a password. So again, you David. And here we go. And here we logged as in David and we can run bash commands normally. However, if we return to root, so it's you. And then I switch user to Sarah. You will see that this account is currently not available. So I can log in. However, I specify no login shell. So Sarah can't run any command because she doesn't have a shell to run command from. So it tells me this account is currently not available. So we can see slash etc password file and from the man pages, man file password, we can see good documentation about it if you want to read more. However, I expect this is more than enough at this point. Another configuration file we will check together is the slash etc slash group. And each line consists of four fields. Okay. So first is group name. Second is encrypted password. Third is numeric group ID. Fourth is the user list that belongs to this group. So this is the way we verify groups. Pretty easy, right? Next thing, we move to modification. So we use the commands user mod and group mod to like change something with attributes. So user mod dash dash help. And you can see we can change many things regarding the user. And same applies with the group. So from the ID of user dolphin, you can see it has primary dolphin ID and secondary dolphin ID. Where is it? Okay, let, let us better write it here. So ID dolphin. Okay. How can I change primary group? for user dolphin and the second group. 
Okay, so I will use the dash G option here with user mod. So user mod dash G HR dolphin. And then if I run ID dolphin, you see the primary group ID has changed from 1000 to 4448. So pretty cool. Also, if I want to add another group for this user, so from options, we can use the dash A option, which is for append, and dash uppercase G for new list of supplementary groups. And we can see Dolphin has primary group ID for HR. So let's, let's run that. So user mod dash A G Dolphin as a group and then dolphin again and id dolphin so here we go it belongs to group hr as a primary and it has another group which is off so let's clear and another verification is by checking the etc group vim slash etc slash group and shift g and you can see here that the dolphin has group dolphin let's manage passwords the command change age is used to modify user password information so i can use the manual you can get a very good documentation and guidance on how to specify the values like for example um the scheme or the format of year month or date okay so i will close the manual and i will use user alia for for this hands on as a reference so first i will set a password for her so with alia and password again dolphin again dolphin and here we go so if i run change age list with dash l alia with uppercase you can okay you can see that last password change is today september 2nd and you can see the minimum number of days between password change or maximum number of days and so on. So this is the information that we want for user password management. So I will do two modifications just for fun. I will first modify the maximum number of days to be two days. So for that, I will run change age. That's just help for guidance. And we can see that we can use the dash M uppercase option for this. So I'll clear. And then change H dash M capital. Oh yeah. Okay. And here we go. So if I list one more time, you can see that the expiry date will be in two days from today, so September 4th. So you can now see that change has taken place. So one last thing, I want to make this account, Ali account, to be expired and when she logs in it tells her a message that this account has expired so for this i will run or i will use the dash e option so basically change age dash e and the scheme of or the format of the year month and then the user alia 
okay, uppercase. And now if I switch to user dolphin, okay, no, now no, it's now it's root, so I will switch to dolphin. And then I will switch to Aria. And I will type the password. You see the message that your account has expired. Please contact your system administrator and that the user has been, uh, the account has been expired. Before everything, please run these commands for now and we'll get to that later in this section. So change mod 755 slash etc slash do doers. Okay. And one more time with D. Okay. So at first, I will go to user dolphin. So as you dolphin. Okay. And then I will try to add user. So user add Marcelo. And we see we get access denied. Okay, so again, I will get back to root. Let us have a look at the sudo first. So vim slash etc slash sudoers. Enter. And then we have the configurations file for sudo. First thing, if I want to have the user dolphin to run anything, you can see this line allows people in group wheel to run all commands. So all I need to do is add user dolphin to the group wheel and that's it. So I close. I will add user dolphin to the group wheel. So user mod dash a g capital wheel and dolphin. Okay, and when I run the ID dolphin, okay, we see it's in the group wheel, okay? Note that you may need to reboot your machine after adding the user to group wheel for the change to take place, so I will reboot. Okay, after rebooting my machine, now I'm working as dolphin user, and then I'll run sudo user add marcelo i will type my password so dolphin and you see it works it returns without any error and we can verify that by sudo id dolphin sorry for that <laughs> sudo id mar Let's make Fernando run everything without being added to the wheel group. Or maybe I can do something cool. I can run sudo vim etc sudoers. And now I can see at this line allow root to run any command anywhere. I will just add a new entry for the user Fernando. So I, Fernando, and this means that all equal all specify that on any host that might have this file, the user root can run any command exactly as any user. Okay, so Fernando, all equal all and tap all and I'll save. Now we can move to user Fernando. So again, I will exit just to go to, I can switch to root and we'll switch to Fernando. Okay. So now I can run something like sudo find 
slash etc slash name password and it asks for password for Fernando. I don't recall I have typed a password for Fernando, but let's see. Okay, let's set a password for Fernando. So exit and then password Fernando, quick one, Fernando. So Dolphin. And again, SU Fernando. And let's try the command one more time. So here and Dolphin. And here we go. So it didn't return any error. We want to allow user like David to run a specific command. For example, we need the location or for example, command like user doll. I will go back to root. Let's clear this. So user like David, I want him to run only user del command. So first I need to specify the location of the command. I will run which user del. And here we go. So the, this command is actually a file or like a script that is located in user as ben user del. I will edit in the sudo words, so vim etc sudo words, and we'll get back to the end of the file. And then here I'll make another entry for David. So David and all host as any user, and we'll specify the command. So user user has been user level, okay? I will quit and save. Set a password for David at, at the moment. Again, Dolphin. Again, Dolphin. If I switch to David, okay? And try to run command like user mod dash u four nines maria and press enter it will ask for password so dolphin okay so it tells me user david is not allowed to execute user has been like the command as root and local host local domain However, it can accept command like sudo user del maria, enter. Again, for one final thing. And, okay, maybe maria is not here, so let's try Emily. And it is deleted. The last thing I want to try is that I want user Ahmed have full authority without being asked asked for a password every time the user. So I'll exit. We'll clear. And then for one final round, vim etc. Sudoers. And then I will go here with Ahmed. I will just copy paste it, copy paste what's with root. And I will specify, okay. I'll specify no password all. And I will now, after we have modified Ahmed to have um, full access to all commands without password, I'll switch user to Ahmed. And I will run something like sudo 
user add Alia and we can see it didn't ask for a password and we didn't need to put or set a new password for user ad. So that's cool. I will carry on on the existing files, my file and my directory. So if I want to add write permission to group to my file, I can use the command change mod g for group plus w my file and to verify we see it's changed so now we have the group anyone with group finance can read and write let's verify this let's add the user fernando to the finance group so we'll run user mod dash a g capital finance fernando okay i'm at user david so i switch to root sorry for that so again user mod Okay, and it worked. And then if I switch user to Fernando, Fernando, and try to vim the file once again, it used to throw an error. However, for now, I can edit again successfully for one more time. For one more time. Pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Let's practice a few more change mode commands. So if I want to remove some permission, I'll use the symbolic link, a symbolic method. So if I run um, change mod G minus X, so that means, or, or maybe O minus X for others, my directory and ll you can see we have removed the execute from my directory very straightforward actually i can remove execute from all by running um change mod a minus x or minus x both works and the file which is uh, maybe the, my directory would be better and ll and you can see we have changed all execute permissions from user and group and others extremely easy okay the last thing i can specify all permissions at once by using the numerical method so i can run change mod 477 my file Okay, okay, and now I'm at Fernando, so again, I'll go back to root, just to make it work. So change mod 477, my file. And it works, and we can see 7 means read, write, execute, 7 means read, write, execute, and 4 means write, so it is applied. Let's practice redirection. Okay, so first I'll make directory called hands on redirection and we'll change directly to it, okay? I'll run the command date, which is a simple command, and you can see it has a clear output and there is no error, so this is the standard output at channel one. If we run the command, find slash etc name password it searches for any file with the name password at the directory etc so i'll run this command and you can see that we have standard output and standard error 
For the errors, we can see permissions denied. So basically, this command has an output at channel one and two. One for standard output, and channel two is standard error. Let's apply redirection. Let's direct the date command here to a file called current date that doesn't exist. Okay, so date greater than current date. And you can see the output is not printed on the screen because it was redirected to the file current date. And when we cat this file, we can see the output. So what if we repeat the command? We can see that the new data has overridden the old value. So what if we want to add to the file, not override it, just to append it? We use the double greater than signs. So date double greater than current date. And you see the new output has been added to the existing file, or we usually call it the output is appended. So let's append the standard error of the find command. So we'll run again the same command. I'll, I'll reach it by the up arrows. And I'll specify the output at channel two, which is the standard error, double greater than and current date. Okay. And we can see now that only the standard output is printed because by default, the standard output at channel one, it's directed to the terminal. And we can see that the errors are appended to the current date. So cat current date. And here we go. So how can we redirect both the standard output and error to this file? and overwrite it. Yes, exactly. We'll use the greater, the and and greater sign as if it directs one and two to this file. So as if it's one and two greater than to the current date. However, we can use the analogy of this one. So find ATC name, password, and enter. We can see that the output, the old output has been removed and the old content has been removed and the new one has been added. In other words, this file has been overridden. We added the channel one output and the sender error to the file. And that's it. Let's practice pipeline. If I list the parent directory with their permissions, so I'll go to the parent directory and LL, and I want to apply different commands to it, to this command. So I will use the pipeline. For example, I can get the last three lines all in one command. How can I do this? I can LL pipeline, the vertical line, then for example, tail dash n three. And here we go. It printed the last three lines. And you can see I haven't specified the file, the argument because it will get it from the first command. So the standard output of the first process will be pipelined as the standard input to the second process, which is sale two important commands, which are find and locate. Sometimes I know the name of the file. However, I'm not able to memorize the full path. That being said, where is it exactly? There are two commands that can solve this problem. The first is find and the second is locate. The find command sometimes can be misleading because it looks easy. I just type find then I will add a few keywords and then it will make sense. 
and it will bring me all the, the all what I need. Okay. However, in our case, we use find to get many many useful information like locating the absolute path of the file. Let's check this and use find. The correct syntax to use find is typing find then the directory you want to search in. So for example, I will search in the etc directory. Find etc and then you specify the options and I will choose name and then type whatever you want. So it will search inside the etc with the pattern of the file or the directory. Here, not only I can use the name, however, with find I can specify options like users, permissions, and links. And of course you can type manual of find and you will get the rest of the option. So find has absolutely amazing manual that you can use it as well. For this particular case, I will type find slash etc name then yum and you can see it printed etc yum which is the only directory that has a matching with the pattern I type. So again one more time if I type cron it doesn't return anything however if I type cron d I just print the exact same pattern okay so this is super useful if I know exactly that the name of the file and with find I can search inside the directory there is another way which is my favorite which is the locate command the locate command searches in a database of all the file path like all the names of the files and directories and basically locate searches for a pattern in this database so you can use locate and pipeline it with grip and you can narrow down the options that you can see and that would make you find your file pretty easy and pretty fast for example i can locate se linux and then you can see lots of options because it printed out every possible path that includes se linux in the file system so if i grab this with atc you can see it limited the output to the output with etc so now the, the output is less okay so now i know that etc se linux is something i worked in before so that's the file i would go to using locate with grep is very useful and it's my personal favorite however there is one example that i'd like to demonstrate here which is if i type touch testing locate okay so this file we are in home okay so if i type locate testing locate it returns without any errors or any output why is that that's because the new file is not updated or not inserted in the database of file what do i need to do to update this database i only need to run update db and then i will run again and you can see the file is within the results i will just need to update the database of files and the results will be there simply if you want to download http in yum you just type yum install http and let's analyze what happens So you can see here, it resolves the dependencies by listing each necessary package with its architecture and version and the repository it brought this package from with its size. And now it gives you a summary of total download size and if I'm okay with it. So I press Y. And here we go. It 
downloaded them and now it's installing these packages and now it's verifying these packages and here we go extremely easy and straightforward there are other options to use with yum like i can search for a certain package so yum search httpd and you can see some packages with their description that contains the name httpd so you choose the package that best suits your need also i can get some information for the httpd package which is yum info httpd And you can see detailed information like name, version, release, repo, URL, and description. So it's quite useful. To display more options of YUM, TapTap -tap would be very useful for you. YUM. Tap tap. And you can see multiple options to choose from. So I will choose REPL list just to know what are the repositories that contain the resources to get the package from. So yum REPL list. And now we can see three REPLs available for use. Now the question is, how can we control our system to do something? This is by using a very, very important command, which is systemctl, systemctl. First of all, systemctl has amazing double tap completion, so it will guide you to the correct syntax without even going to the manual. All you need to know is to choose which option will help us to do something. So for example, I will select status followed by tap tap. And you can see here we have a huge number of services. Do you really want to list all of them? I will say no. And I will just type HTTPD. And here we can see it's not even installed on the system. So how can we fix this? We need to redownload it first. So I will run yum install dash y http now it's downloaded i will clear first and then i will run again the same command i just run which is systemctl status http.service here we can see it's loaded and inactive and there is a reference to the manual page of the HTTPD. So I want to store the HTTPD service, so I will run systemctl start HTTPD the service, and it returns without error. So that means it runs successfully. We'll check the status again, and we can see here it's active running. Okay, and here comes the log of the services there are some valuable informations like the main process id and the memory for example and so on we have something here to focus on which is the disabled keyword here okay that means that the process will not be started at boot time 
If we want this process to be run at boot time, so that being said, we don't want to run systemctl start HTTPD service each time we start our machine, all we need to do is to enable this service. So I will run systemctl enable HTTPD service. Now the service is enabled and now we can run a few checks to check on this service. So I will clear and then we'll run, for example, if I want to check if this service is active, so I will run systemctl is tap tap. Okay, I will choose the is active and then HTTPD the service. And now it tells me it's, it's active. If I want to check if it's enabled, same idea. Okay, I believe it's very easy to use systemctl. And by the way, it's going to be an essential part of your daily troubleshooting. Because, you know, sometimes when you are performing some tasks, you will need to narrow down the possibilities of the cause by checking the services. We always need to check if the service is active or not, enabled or not, maybe check its logs and so on. One more thing is the unit files. Systemd only understands unit files. So how can we find these unit files? Here we go. We will run ls user lib systemd system and I will pipeline the output with this. And here we go. These are the unit files that systemd has access to. These literally controls anything you can do in the system and we can add or create more unit files just to add some functionality to the system and systemd will handle this unit file. For example, mounting a file system, this has to go through a unit file that systemd has control on. And that brings us to the possibility of developing our own services by writing a unit file and this unit file can be responsible to mount a file system beside the fs tab file. Definitely that can be done. However, configuring the unit files is not within the scope of this course. It's a little bit advanced. However, feel free to open any of it and just have a look. So for example, I will run vim user lib systemd system and then HTTPD the service and you can see this is how the unit file is written we can see the unit description once after documentation service the type the environment and all other parameters so I will close and now uh, using system CTL we can list all unit files by running system CTL list unit files for example i will type um, service and you can see all the unit files created with their state whether it's enabled or or disabled it only limits the services unit files in the output the first thing we are going to check is the manual of the principal command and in our case it will be the command ps that is used for listing the processes. So man ps. And we can see its simple description. It reports a snapshot of the current process and it's only used and with options. Okay. So now there are three types of options. One in which we must not use a dash, one which we must use the dash before options, and the last in which we must use double dashes before the options. So take care of that. And if you scroll down, you can see lots of useful examples. So I'll search with example. And you can see these examples very useful and very easy to follow. And if you search for state, you can see that state flags we talked about in the last lecture. So no need to memorize what each flag represents. So it's very useful. Last but not least in the manual, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the sorting option that we can use to sort the processes based on certain keys like this way this is how we can sort with the sorting 
option. You can see the PS manual is very useful and I believe it covers all you need as a system administrator. So for now, I'll close the manual. So I'll run PS alone without any options on two terminals. So I will open a new one and adjust them for better visibility. PS alone without options in both terminals. So PS. And here again. Okay. So it displays the processes that associated with the current terminal. The output is as follows. First is the process ID. Second column is the TTY, which is the controlling terminal. And you can see that for terminal one, it takes PTS slash zero. In terminal two, it takes PTS slash one. Third column is the CPU time consumed for each process. And the last column is the command for each process. So pretty easy. Now I will just maximize one terminal to continue working on it. I will start using options and the most common option is the command PS. AUX and by the way dash AUX is exactly AUX however both follow different option styles because dash AUX basically means list all the processes for user X but if user X doesn't exist it will just interpret it as AUX and prints a warning so take care of that and can you note this can be an advanced interview Linux question so back to our terminal, PS AUX means to list all processes, including processes without a controlling terminal with more column. Press enter. And you can see the output is long. For this, I will pipeline to limit that and just print the first lines using it. So PS AUX had and here we go. It added columns for process user owner, CPU utilization percentage, memory utilization percentage. The VSZ column displays the amount of virtual memory being consumed by the process. RSS is the actual physical wired in memory that's being used. STAT, which stands for the process state. And the start column shows the date or time for when the process was started. This is different from the CPU time reported by the time column. And finally, the command which run this process. So this is how you read the PSAX command. And with grip, you can search for a certain command or process. For example, PS AUX prep bash and now we limited our search or our output that to process our entry that contains the bash. Okay. Another option that we can use with processes is with dash and most common is PS dash EF. So clear PS dash EF and again with pipeline with head. So the difference is that it shows the parent process ID and C by and by the way C is a rough figure to represent the percentage of the CPU time the process is responsible for consuming S time is the start time and the rest is exactly as the above options
All right, so we came to the end of the video. Hopefully that was beneficial and you benefited immensely, which was the purpose behind the video. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel, activate the notification, and also share it so you can support us and you can help us benefit the masses. If you want to know more about Linux, this course is part of an eight and a half hours course that's available on dolphinet.com. And here's the name of the course. And this course has a lot more to know about Linux, including networking on AWS, introduction to bash scripting and scheduling, and a lot more on system tuning and performance, disk management, network file system, and a lot more. So that will be a true deep dive. And if you would like to be in the system administration or in the tuning of systems, if you are in the operation side of cloud, then that definitely is going to be of help. And you'll find the link to the course in the description below. Moreover, this course is actually part of a roadmap that consists of 12 steps, including AWS, Azure, DevOps, and also a lot of hands-on projects. And again, you'll find that in the description below. If cloud and DevOps is where you are headed and you'd like to achieve up to four certificates in one year, if you spend two hours a day, then this is a roadmap clear carefully designed, all stitched together, logical flow, so you don't have to waste time looking for different courses from different places. And you get access for two years, just in case if you get busy, then you will have enough access, or if you are on the job after interviews, then you can always reference the content again. All right, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully that was beneficial, and I'll see you again in another beneficial cloud DevOps machine learning, artificial intelligence, and a lot more of videos we are planning to publish. Please subscribe and activate the notification so you will get to know when we publish new courses. Thank you so much.